Anna-Christine Klotz. Anna Christine Klotz, she is a PhD candidate at the Freie University in Berlin at the Eastern European Institute, where she also received her BA in History and Jewish Studies and in an MA uh, uh, in Eastern European Studies. So there's a close relationship to this university. Uh, before and during her studies, she worked as a volunteer for a German NGO, Action Reconcilia Reconciliation Service for Peace, um, and as a junior fellow in the Department collection project, the persecution and extermination of the European Jews by Nazi Germany, which is a 16 volume series of um, Holocaust documents, a huge uh, kind of joint project of the Federal Archive. Actually did the first volume for this project, so that's also close. Uh, um, and um, she uh, also uh, is Oh, she's currently a claims conference Saul Kagan Fellow in advanced uh, Shoah studies and writes her thesis on individual and collect collective reactions of Polish Jewish journalists. Um, and this is practically, I think, the topic of the paper. So welcome her uh, with a warm hand. Um, thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? Um, yes, thank you for the introduction and I would also like to uh, say thank you for the organizers for inviting me and presenting my research and discuss it with you. So in June 1933, 46 delegates from different Polish-Jewish local anti-Nazi protest and aid committees for refugees from Germany came together at a conference in Katowice. There they talked about the present and future function and organization of the committees, which had been active for three months in several Polish towns and villages. The delegate from the Polish capital was Mark Turkov. Born in 94 in Warsaw, Turkov was a well-known Jewish journalist working for the Yiddish language Zionist newspaper Der Moment, The Moment. In spring 1933, he had become the elected general secretary of the committee in Warsaw. At the conference, he explained not only what the committee had done during the last months, but also highlighted the important role the Jewish press in Warsaw played. And here I quote from the protocol. In Warsaw, a cross-party committee in which all political directions and economical organizations are represented was set up. The Jewish press had been conducting a widespread propaganda campaign for the refugees from Germany from the first moment on. The conference was the beginning of a constant and systematic confrontation with the topics national socialism, anti-Semitism, and fascism within the Jewish communities in Poland. The press served as both an initiator of the campaign and a motivator for the Jewish masses to take part in the protest and solidarity movement. International press respondents to the persecution of Jews from 1933 until the Holocaust, notably those of Western European and American newspapers, have aroused uh, academic interest since the early 1960s. However, scholars like Josef Gurne have pointed out that Jewish press reactions to the persecution in particular have been the subject of just a few studies. This applies especially to the numerous publications of the Polish Jewish press of the Second Polish Republic, which has only recently become an area of interest to historians. Although the developments in Nazi Germany had a direct impact on Jews in Poland already in the early 1930s, the question of how the Polish Jewish intelligentsia, and here especially the Yiddish speaking intelligentsia, reacted towards the rise of national socialism still remains widely unanswered. With the exception of a few handful of scientific works on selected events by scholars such as Daniel Greenberg, Nathan Cohen, Yifat Weiss, Katrin Steffen, and Anna landau Schaika, a comprehensive study on the theoretical, practical, and mental approaches by Polish Jews is still missing, as the Polish historian Joanna Nalewajko Kulikow noticed in 2015. In this talk, I will explore the journalist's role in gaining knowledge on the persecution of Jews in Nazi Germany, and furthermore, spreading this knowledge within Warsaw Jewish community. I consider them not only as key figures in the process of acquiring knowledge, but also as mediators within the forming protest and aid movement. 
In a, seven, a second step, I will argue that the political radicalization and the worsening living conditions for Jews in both Germany and Poland during the second half of the 1930s directly affected the press coverage on the so-called Poland Aktion and the November programs in, 30, um, in 1938. With the influx of Jews from Eastern Europe during the 1920s, Berlin had become a new Yiddish cultural, political, and literary center. So much so that in 1932, the literary Warsaw Yiddish magazine, the Literarische Blätter, Literary Pages, devoted one of its issues to Berlin as a new Yiddish cultural hub. Many of the Jewish intellectuals from Poland had a deeply felt affinity for German high culture and literature, had studied or lived in Germany for quite some time, and shared friendly contacts with Jewish intellectuals living in the country, as can be seen in the address books of the journalist and writer Melech Ravitch. Therefore, every Jewish daily newspaper in Warsaw had at least one correspondent in Berlin during the 1920s and the 1930s. These foreign correspondents had the task to cover the news in Weimar Germany from an Eastern European Jewish point of view. Their role became even more important after Hitler came to power in January 1933. Their professional and private networks reaching far into German political and cultural circles, as well as their collected expertise, made it possible to give the Jewish readers in Poland a wholesome picture of the German conditions apart from official German press releases. One journalist working for the Yiddish press in Warsaw was Nathan Frenkel. Born in 1896 in Warsaw, he joined the General Jewish Labour Bund in his early 20s. After the First World War, Frenkel moved to Berlin, where he opened his own tailor shop in 1926. But he also began to work illegally as a correspondent for the Neue Volkszeitung. Using his pen name, Nathan Schneider, which is Yiddish for Taylor, Frankel wrote a regular column called A Brief von Deutschland, a letter from Germany, in which he described the political and social atmosphere in Berlin for the newspaper readers. Because he was a socialist and a Polish Jew, he had contacts to both social groups. Frankel attended socialist elections campaigns, anti-fascist meetings, and demonstrations in Berlin. During these events, he often used the opportunity to interview some of his German comrades about the political situation in Germany, whereas in other reports, he laid his focus on the expulsion of Jews of Eastern European origin. However, in early April 1933, Frankel had to flee to Paris together with his family. In an interview he gave to the Swiss Foreign Police in 1942 applying for asylum, Frankel explained, I quote from the protocol, I also add that I was wanted and searched by the Gestapo for my activity as a journalist who was against the Hitler regime. Frankel's case is exemplary for most of the long-time Polish-Jewish correspondents in Berlin I was able to identify. In contrast to non-Jewish foreign correspondents, the situation for reporters of Jewish origin became extremely insecure after Hitler had become chancellor, which is why most of them left Berlin no later than 1934. Already in 1932, more than a month before Hitler became appointed chancellor, a secret list circulated within the press department of the Foreign Office in Berlin. This list collected the names of Foreign Jewish and non-Jewish journalists either from Poland or writing for a Polish or Polish Jewish newspaper. To the German Foreign Office, the journalist's work had become questionable. Next to their names, one can read little handwritten remark such as Jew, national Jewish, rather difficult or indeed offensive. The fact that during the early 1930s, most of the Jewish correspondents had to flee forced the newspaper in Warsaw to find new sources and other ways to get reliable information about what was happening in Nazi Germany in contrast to what the official German news were telling. Additionally, interviews with Jewish refugees, such as the socialist Friedrich Stampfer or the historian Simon Dubnov, reprints from other international or even from illegal socialist and communist German magazines and le or leafless, guest contributions and travel logs from Germany had become important sources for the newspapers. The Heind even managed to hire Esriel Karlebach, a German-Jewish journalist from Leipzig, to write illegal reports on Jewish life under the Nazi regime in the first half of 1933 for the newspaper. 
During the early 1930s, more than a dozen Jewish journalists from Poland traveled themselves legally and illegally to Nazi Germany and wrote reports or travelogues for the Yiddish press. Out of the group of Jewish journalists from Warsaw, Mark Turkov was probably the first one sent to Germany by a Jewish newspaper from Warsaw. Uh, in February 1933. He himself explained the editor's decision for sending him there in his first report. I quote, the interest in Germany's inner affairs is one that can easily be understood, especially for us living in direct neighborhood to this country in conflict and for whom the outcome of the German events is most concerning. This is also the reason why we decided now to go on a journey through Germany. The shock Jewish intellectuals from Poland felt when Hitler came to power in January 1933 and the beginning persecution of Jews explained at least partly why Tukov, Turkov and other journalists became active in the protest and aid movement. According to his memoirs, even the whole idea of an organized protest movement was born in the rooms of the famous association of Jewish journalists and writers in Warsaw already in March 1933. An announcement in the newspaper Hind proves that the first provisory office of the Warsaw Central Aid Committee was in fact situated in the very rooms of the Journalist Association. And following a report submitted by the German Embassy in Warsaw, who observed the activities of the committees closely, the Warsaw Committee alone registered and financially supported 4,000 Jewish refugees until July 1934. In June 1935, the Polish police searched the rooms of the Jewish Central Buyers Association, where the Committee for Boycotting German good, Goods had its headquarters and shut it down. This measure was a result of direct interventions by German authorities after the German-Polish non-aggression declaration had become effective in 1934. With the official shutdown of the boycott committee, internal conflicts and a lack of financial and moral support from the community, the protest and likewise the solidarity movement came to a first provisory halt. At the same time, general interest in news from Germany was in decline, as in the advent of the 1936 Olympic Games, German anti-Jewish aggression toned down a while, while in Poland the political landscape was changing both rapidly and drastically, after the statesman Józef Piłsudski had died in 1935. In the second half of the 1930s, Polish Jewry suffered multiple blows. The results of the Great Depression, a spreading anti-Jewish boycott, increased government anti-Semitism, as well as several pogroms. Thus, in the 1930s, also many Yiddish newspapers struggled to survive. Even the oldest and most prestigious ones, like the Hind or Der Moment, which were founded in the early 1920s century, had serious financial problems, as their circulation had dropped by nearly two-thirds compared to its peak of around 100,000 a day around 1920. Additionally, the sta state repression and censorship intensified, as well as anti-Jewish attitudes, considerable. Chaim Finkelstein, a former editor of The Hind, recalls the traumatic cir circumstances under which the journalists and writers had to work. I quote, quite a number of times the printing house of Hind was destroyed by gangs of hooligans. One time they used to break out the windows or to crack the tables and the banks. Another time they used to scatter the hand composition or they used to crack the machines. The police never succeeded in finding the attackers. Employees of the hind have been terrorized through the telephone or the mail, one used to threaten them. The constantly deteriorating living conditions and the lack of employment brought quite a few journalists to a point where they considered the question of leaving Poland for good. On the other hand, Eastern European Jewry had faced outbursts of violent anti-Semitism over many generations, as they always had been a vital part of the Eastern European realities. Therefore, they were not only experienced in living with and enduring anti-Semitism, but also in fighting it. It was this specific Eastern European tradition of fighting and defending oneself against anti-Semitism and struggling for Jewish rights that had fostered the political involvement of Jewish journalists in various political events. They shared a common self-image, regardless of their personal political background, which made them responsible for the Jewish masses, feel responsible. Turkov recalls, the papers did not remain satisfied with the fact 
that their publicists expressed their views or showed initiative in their articles. But in times of emergency, the journalist was called upon to be the advisor of public figures or to serve as a medium for fundraising campaigns for local or general national purposes. The tools for filling the self-image with life were named by Simon Dubnov and other Jewish writers already in 1903, shortly after the pogrom in Kishinev. Investigative research, ethnographic observations, interviews with victims and refugees, collecting evidence, keeping record, producing literary output, and finally becoming politically involved while expressing a transnational Jewish solidarity. The ultimate goal was to describe anti-Semitic violence from the perspective of the victims. The Yiddish press used these tools in 1933 and, as we will see now, would do so also in 1938. When in October 1938 Nazi Germany expelled thousands of Polish Jews from Germany by pushing them across the Polish border and shortly after thousands of Jewish shops, houses and synagogues had been destroyed by the Nazis, a desperate situation had arisen. For the Jewish intellectuals in Warsaw, it became clear once more how deeply intertwined their fate was with that of Jews living in Germany. On November 14, 1938, the president of the Warsaw Lodge of the Binay Bri, Shimon Seidenmann, informed its members, who were mostly academics, journalists, representatives, and businessmen, about the recent events in Germany. Here I quote from the protocol. Unfortunately, it looks like the news from there are true. The Jewish congregation in Berlin is closed, the Palestinian office was destroyed, the certificates burned, the leaders of diverse social institutions are in prison, the majority of the Jewish shops have been destroyed. This is a picture of German Jewry. And about those who were expelled, one part around 6,500 persons and more are situated in Spodgen under terrible conditions, without a roof over their head and without the right to leave. A return to their homes is out of question. We have no clear information on where this detailed account came from, but logic suggests that there is a connection to the first articles on the November pogroms, which appeared in the Warsaw Yiddish press just was one day earlier. Additionally, only one week earlier, a new aid committee for Jewish refugees had been set up in Warsaw, and quite a few members of the Binay Bri order, among them their president and several journalists, were personally involved. Yet again, Jewish journalists played a crucial role in supporting the movement with the help of their professional skills. They were responsible to launch, and here I quote from the report of the committee, a propaganda campaign to make Polish Jewry conscious of the necessity of making contributions in favor of refugees, and a publicity campaign in the press by means of articles, news items, and features, all especially written by competent journalists. The press section of the committee consisted of well-known journalists of the Yiddish press, like Mark Turkov, Samuel Volkovich, and Leon Rosen, all of whom have been active already in the first committee in 1933. The November programs were shocking for the Warsaw Yiddish daily newspapers. For several days, the newspaper headlines and many items and articles were dedicated to the pogroms. But compared to the press coverage during the first months after Hitler came to power in 1933, the acquisition of knowledge about the persecution of Jews in Nazi Germany had become more difficult. Not only did the news travel slower than in 1933, the coverage of the program was also less intense, both in terms of the quantity of the articles that were published and the quality of the information featured therein. Apart from two journalists, namely Isaac Meyer Glicksmann and Josef Lanschena, who were still living in Berlin and working for the Yiddish press in Poland, probably all Jewish correspondents had left. On the other hand, communication with members of the Jewish community was extremely difficult and often impossible. Not only did the Yiddish newspapers lack the reliable sources within Nazi Germany, they did also lack the financial resources and support to cover trips from their own journalists abroad. Before the German-Polish non-aggression declaration sprung into action, the journalists were frequently supported in their travels to Germany through the Polish foreign office. In 1938, however, support had turned into widespread censorship. At first, the Polish government had tried to ban all coverage of the Poland Aktion, but even after this had proven to be ineffective, information was still harder to get and less to verify. 
Thus, the journalists relied more and more on the information they got through official national and international newspapers or press agencies, like the Jewish and the Polish Telegraphic Agency, as well as on their non-Jewish Polish colleagues. Der Moment, for example, printed an exclusive multi-piece feature from a Polish journalist named Włodzimierz Szlenski, who in early December 1938 traveled to Berlin to cover the aftermath of the pogroms. Only at the end of November, first detailed analyses were published. The most discussed topics were the hidden intentions behind the pogroms and debates on the meaning of the pogroms for Polish Jewry and how they, as Jews, should now respond. Deprived of the usual journalistic methods and rights, the interest in the pogroms should soon decline and the Yiddish press draw its attention to closer concerns, the refugees and Spozhen. Various Yiddish newspapers from Warsaw began to collect money. Der Moment and Naya Volkszeitung occasionally published lists of donors and the sums they donated to the committee. The Jewish Writers and Journalists Association in Warsaw imposed a tax on itself in favor of the persecuted. At the end of November, it had become a common practice to travel to the camp in Spozhen. There, the journalists began to talk to Jewish refugees and to write down their stories. Because the refugees were in close contact with their family and friends who were still living in Germany, the journalists could via this also get reliable information on the programs. They were aware that the so-called Poland Aktion and the November pogroms were important issues. In his memoirs, Mendel Barbaritschki, a Jewish journalist from Roots, explained, I quote, that it was from them, the Jewish refugees, that they learned of the anti-Jewish edicts, of persecution, of humiliation, and of the executions. I come to the conclusion. The so-called Poland Aktion and the November pogroms came as a shock to the Jewish community in Poland but it was a shock that had been expected somehow. However, the journalists always tried to stress the positive. Even when the future seemed hopeless, it was important to keep on going and to keep on fighting. In this way, the media coverage in 1933 and the first protest movement can be seen as a test run for 1938. Even under the most precarious working conditions, the journalists held on to their expected social function. Although the press coverage on the political developments in Nazi Germany had become more difficult as newspapers lacked correspondence and investigative research within Nazi Germany was no longer possible, they found ways to cover the events from October and November 1938 in detail from their own Jewish perspective. Equipped with profound knowledge on the Nazi policies and anti-Semitism from the previous years and already experienced in doing interviews with Jewish refugees in 1933, they made now systematic use of these accounts. The reports were published in all Yiddish Warsaw newspapers until the last le refugees left Spozhen shortly before the outbreak of the war and shortly before the journalists themselves should become refugees. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say I'm sorry for being late. It's election day traffic, so maybe it's good news. I'm Marla Stone. I teach at Occidental College. Uh, I work on uh, Italian fascism, and um, I'm very pleased to be here. Take the first question. What was the reason that the Polish... Please wait for the microphone so oh, the live sorry. stream can hear you. So, one, two... Now, what was the reason for the Polish press to be censoring uh, the Poland Axion, was it because they wanted to maintain good relations with Germany or was it because they had decided to not allow these Jews to re-enter Poland? the uh, Polish-German non-aggression declaration, uh -huh. but also they wanted to um, turn down the press coverage on the camp in Spozhen because they feared when other people outside of Poland would read uh, those reports that it would shed a bad light on Poland as a country. Uh, you know, directed not only at you, but the um, other paper that we had yesterday dealing with press coverage. And um, so I'm wondering about the role of the JTA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, uh, which uh, really was a kind of uh, a nerve center, as it was, a kind of clearinghouse for Jewish news around mm -hmm. the world. Uh, and um, how much did JTA 
uh, cover this, penetrate mm -hmm. into uh, Polish and German and other um, uh, news outlets. Yes, so um, there was a JTA office in Berlin until 1933 and then they moved to Prague and Warsaw also had a JTA office. And the Yiddish press, but also the Polish-speaking uh, Jewish press, made uh, extensively use of the JTA um, press coverage and also of the Polish telegraphic agency, but they used also Havas and Reuters. But I would say, um, as far as I see it, that they used mostly the Jewish telegraphic agency news service to cover the events. Since you began with 1933, I have this question for you. To what extent was there a continuum in the perception of the situation in Germany? Can you to, speak a bit louder? To what extent was there a continuum in the understanding of the relationship between Jews and the developing uh, Nazi uh, force in Germany? And to what extent was there a discontinuity? That is to say, can you distinguish between what was continual right through Kristallnacht mm -hmm. and what was different? Specifically, was there any element of uh, shock or, uh, uh, yeah, shock or surprise to what happened? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that 1933 came as a shock for the Yiddish Warsaw press or for the Jewish community in Poland. And they were, first of all, shocked by the uh, outburst of anti-Semitic violence and also by the implementation of the anti-Jewish laws because they really had, before 1933, they really had a positive picture of Germany and German society and German Jewry. And so afterwards, they were in, in a deep shock and also uh, they were really sad because they feel that the area of uh, German Jewish high culture and Berlin as a Yiddish uh, center had come to an end. And in 1938, I would say that um, the November programs came also as a shock to them, but it was somehow, um, I would say, not that new anymore because they already where have experienced uh, the German policy over the last six years. So there were really, the journalists were really experts on anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany and on fascism. They really monitored all the political developments really closely and all the time they had contacts to Jews in Germany and also to the Jewish refugees coming into Poland. So they um, put it into this bigger picture, I would say. It was a shock, but it was not an expected shock. Yes, thank you for your outstanding paper. Um, I wonder, w uh, I mean, I, I used the, this, this scan of, of Nash Przegląd yesterday. Um, I wonder what the result would be if you would integrate uh, the Polish language, mm -hmm. Jewish press of the period whether there would be a significant shift in perspective and perception, uh, and um, uh, also uh, how, how communication functioned between the various languages used mm -hmm. in the Polish-Jewish press. Um, I really appreciated your, your, uh, the care you uh, give to the, to the networking, to the Context through the contacts between between journalists and the international relations. It's it's very important. What I realized that we don't have at this conference a uh, presentation about the Jewish Chronicle, uh, which was uh, after the demise of the Allgemeine Zeitung des Judentums, probably the internationally leading press outlet, mm -hmm. Jewish press outlet. Have you looked into that? Uh, no. <laughs> um. Uh, the last question I can answer, no, I haven't. Um, and regarding the contacts between the Polish language Jewish press and the Yiddish press, there were close contacts and most of the journalists wrote sometimes 
or not always, but sometimes, for example, Bernard Singer, for the Polish press, but also for the Yiddish press. And all of the journalists were organized in the association of Jewish journalists and writers in Warsaw. So they met there all the time, and they could exchange information there. And also the journalist association uh, organized a lot of lectures and talks by uh, Polish Jewish journalists who traveled to Nazi Germany, <coughs> then came back, then they organized an event, a public event, and it was advertised in the Polish language press, but also in the Yiddish press. So they're really intermingled all the time with each other. And um, regarding uh, the content in the Polish language press, um, I would say you have a slight shift um, regarding the censorship because the Polish government um, was much more stricter in censoring the Polish language Jewish press because they also had a non-Jewish Polish readership. So this was really important. And the Yiddish press, they uh, of course also censored, but mostly they censored the Yiddish press when they wrote uh, about anti-Semitism in Poland itself. and when they wanted to cover the reported of Nazi Germany, they were um, much more, I would say, open because before the Polish-German non-aggression pact sprung into action in 34, uh, the Polish government even supported the boycott movement because there was also a really strong non-Jewish Polish boycott movement. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I, I have a question. Thank no. you for a wonderful paper, and I, I think the idea of the social role of journalists in times of crisis is really, really interesting. And did you find a lot of reflections among the journalists about their changing role from reporter to activist to mm -hmm. kind of, oh. I'm sorry. Were people not able to hear? Should I repeat? Well, just, there's a live stream. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So my question was around the changing role of journalists and what you called, I think correctly, the social role of journalists. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if they reflected on the transition in their own lives from the early 30s through, uh, through the late 30s and becoming activists and becoming kind of um, the Cassandras of their community mm -hmm. in many ways. Um, not all are writing about this, but a few of them. and. It's really interesting because most of them point out the 1930s, at a, of course, as a really crucial time in Poland, also in regard um, with the events have going on in Germany. And so they reflect on this, uh, and I try to show that with the, um, uh, with the caption of Mark Turkov, that he then reflected on his role as social and political agents, that the journalists uh, served as a form of medium for the community and that they were like the advisors also of public figures that they went to all those organizations and they traveled um, through Poland and visited different communities and gave lectures there to motivate the Jewish community also in smaller towns to become active in the protest movement. So, yeah, they reflected on this. Other questions for Anderson? Oh, in the back. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm, oh, thank you. Um, in terms of the Yiddish press in Poland by 1938, I'm wondering about the readership. Clearly, intellectual readers in Warsaw mm -hmm. were reading and had access to the information. But I'm wondering if in outlying cities, you know, say in Bialystok or in smaller cities, to what extent would a person who was not, say, politically active mm -hmm. have access to this information? How widely was this disseminated? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. I would always say that the closer the Polish town was to the German border, the more they reported on the events uh, in Nazi Germany because they felt closer, of course. And um, in Białystok, you mentioned it, for example, Białystok itself had also a really vital Yiddish press, and they also wrote about the events in Nazi Germany. So readers there could also um, 
have a really good picture of what was going on in Nazi Germany, but I would always stress out that in Warsaw, um, the most press coverage was going on, on and from Warsaw because there were at journalists, but at the same time intellectuals who were traveling all the time over Europe and had a lot of uh, established contacts uh, to other Jewish intellectuals. Um, the press coverage was more intense, but for example, I had a look into the collection of uh, the YIVO. The YIVO Institute did, um, um, they did, uh, an, what is it, a Wettbewerb? Does someone can help me? A competition, right. The YIVO Institute uh, did, at the end of the 1930s, a competition to motivate uh, young Polish Jews to hand in um, exposés on their and reflecting their life as Polish Jews in the 1930s in Poland. And when you have a look into those uh, exposés, what they wrote, you can sometimes see that uh, a young Jewish uh, girl or a young Jewish boy from a small town in Poland wrote something like, now we have the year 1938 and we have all the uh, Jewish refugees from Germany coming into our country and they are all in Spozhen and every day we read in the Yiddish press about what is going on in Spozhen. So they really reflected on this. Yeah. Um, thanks for your interesting lecture. Um, uh, I wonder, uh, uh, did you notice some uh, differences in covering uh, the Christian Nacht in uh, uh, Yiddish newspapers uh, from uh, different uh, uh, camps. Uh, so mm -hmm. the moment, and I didn't see here a tagblad of the Orthodox Jews and other. Yes. So I'm dealing mostly um, with Moment, Die Neue Volkszeitung, and Heinz, so two uh, Zionist newspapers and one socialist newspaper, or Zionist-leaning newspaper. The um, Moment made a shift from the 1920s. They were supporters of the Volkes camp, and then after uh, 1935, they supported uh, the revisionist Zionist movement. Um, here, I would also answer when you have a look in the press coverage in 1933, they uh, reflected on the events differently. And there you can see much more the political impact the journalists and the newspapers had. But in 1938, you see that they um, mostly um, used, first of all, the same uh, press information from the press agencies. And uh, they went together. It was an organized journey. They went together as journalists to Spozhen. And there they conducted the interviews. And they spoke to, to the same Jewish refugees. So the press coverage is um, much, not much more the same. You, of course, you still have uh, political differences because the Bundespress, the Neue Volkszeitung, of course, always had a much closer focus also on socialists and communists uh, and socialist refugees, for example. And uh, they also, in terms of how they should react now as a Jewish community in Poland on the events in Nazi Germany, they had different ideas on how to, how to react on this, for example. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeffrey Kuber, Kerber. Um, Jeff Kerber is an assistant professor of history at Chapman University in Orange, California. He holds a PhD in Holocaust history from Clark University, as well as a bachelor's and master's degree in architecture from the University of Illinois. Dr. Kerber has published widely on historic architecture and building preservation. His work on historic structures and sites has prompted his research into the relationships linking place, historic, historical actors, and events. His research on the experiences of young Jews in the borderlands of the Soviet Union and Poland during the Holocaust. He has received fellowships from the Claims Conference, the USC Shoah Foundation, the Holocaust Education Foundation, 
uh, the Tauber Institute for the Study of European Jewry. And his talk today is entitled, What Did Soviet Jews Make of Kristallnacht? Thank you very much. And hopefully we'll have no more problems here, but that's OK. Uh, as uh, in, you heard in my introduction, um, uh, I primarily look at the experience of Jewish youth who grew up in the 1930s um, in the Polish-Soviet borderlands, and my research follows their experiences through the Holocaust. So this, pro this paper today is drawn from that larger project. <coughs> On the 11th of November, 1938, the Soviet Yiddish newspaper Aktyabr, published in Minsk, printed a front page photo we have seen often. Stalin and the Soviet leadership standing atop Lenin's tomb. This particular gathering marked the 21st anniversary of the October Revolution. Below the photo ran a startling news item, Jewish pogroms in Germany. It told how Nazi stormtroopers had beaten Jews in their homes and in the streets. Many had been killed. Synagogues were vandalized and or destroyed by fire. The story noted the unprecedented scope of these actions. News items like these of what later became known as Kristallnacht were readily available in the Soviet press under Stalinism. Indeed, readers had long been able to follow developments in Nazi Germany. Whether they interpreted this news as presenting any specific danger to their lives is another story. I will examine the content of the news stories showing the unfolding stages of anti-Semitic persecution in Nazi Germany and I will analyze what meaning these had for Jews living under Stalinism. I focus today on perspectives from the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, today the Republic of Belarus. As a western border region of the Soviet Union, it later experienced the brunt of the Nazis' genocidal policies. First, I offer some background on the status of Soviet Jews uh, during the interwar years. After the revolution, the Bolsheviks sought to transform Jews from an oppressed minority to equal status alongside other Soviet nationalities. Leading the way, leading the way was, during the 1920s was the Avsexia, was the, the Jewish section of the Communist Party. The Avsexia dismantled Jewish communal institutions, seized synagogues, and promoted anti-religious propaganda. Among the institutions that took their place were Yiddish language theaters, publications, sc and school systems, each governed in their content according to party principles. By the late 1930s, however, support for Yiddish language institutions had diminished. Many younger Soviet Jews spoke Russian in their daily lives, not Yiddish. This was because the best education and employment opportunities necessitated knowing the pre this predominant language. These were also the years of the Great Terror, which peaked during the purges of 1937 and 1938. All minority cultures in the Soviet borderlands faced curtailment during the purges. In Soviet Belarusia, for example, the party closed the Yiddish language schools in the summer of 1938 and reopened them in the fall of 1938 as Belarusian language institutions. Leading Yiddish writers in Minsk and elsewhere dis, um, disappeared, becoming victims of the purges. However, Soviet Belarusia retained. Okay. Um, Soviet Belarusia retained its Yiddish newspaper Aktyabr, which continued um, in pu its publication up to the um, German invasion of June 1941. Russian-speaking Jews could also turn to the party's other Minsk newspaper, Rabochi, The Worker, which was later renamed Sovetskaya Belarusia. Belarusian Jews reading Yiddish or Russian newspapers had access to international updates edited from Reuters and other wire services. Many stories focus on the West economic dep depression uh, and resulting political turmoil. About Germany, for example, party newspapers reported the economic and political crises of 1931 and 1932 in Germany um, as an initial stage of proletarian revolution. 
Such reports continued even after the Nazi takeover in the first months of 1933. Although political cartoons uh, featured Chancellor Hitler showing him as a grotesque dwarf, the ugly hatchet man of capitalism, the Soviet press declared that communists were still engaged fighting Nazism. Actions targeting Jews also appeared in the Soviet press. Oktyabr, for the 1st of April, 1933, told of the Nazi party's planned boycott of Jewish businesses, businesses across Germany. The next day, Oktyabr gave details. Not Nazi stormtroopers stood outside Jewish stores to warn away prospective customers. Some shops closed that Saturday, typically the busiest shopping day of the week. Over the following years, sporadic news items kept Belarus's Jews, Belarus's Jews up to date. In July 1935, Jewish-owned stores were vandalized in Berlin, Augsburg, and Breslau. Readers learned not only about attacks on property, but efforts to forcefully isolate German Jews from quote-unquote Aryans. Der Emis, the Communist Party's Yiddish newspaper in Moscow, reported on the 24th of July, 1935, about the arrest of Jews accused of miscegenation with Aryan women. Indeed, this wave of violence, coupled with efforts to bar, to bar social contact between Jews and Aryans, motivated the Nazi leadership to codify new legal measures. These were the Nuremberg Laws, issued in September 1935 during the Nazi Party's annual rally. Oktyabr ran a brief report on these measures. The Reich Citizenship Law declared only a, citi only a citizen um, uh, of Germany can be a German with, with German or similar blood. The law for the protection of German blood and honor forbade marriage between Germans and Jews. The brevity of this particular story raises a significant issue. How well did the Soviet press educate its readers on Nazi racial theory? How were ordinary readers of Oktyabr supposed to interpret what German blood really meant? Bolshevik ideology rejected such biological determinism, making the new German laws all the more obscure to Soviet Jews. Nonetheless, detailed Soviet analyses of Nazi racial ideology appear to have been reserved for academic journals. Little wonder, perhaps, that the Soviet press in Minsk failed to report on the legal definition of Jew set forth on November 14, 1935, in Berlin. Also curious is the focus on the economic impact of the April boycott and the summer 1935 riots attacking Jewish shops, a pattern we will see in the reporting on Kristallnacht as well. We know, uh, although Soviet readers could not, that the chain of events leading to Kristallnacht began with the Nazis' expulsion of thousands of Polish Jews at the end of October. The Russian language, Sovetskaya Be Belarusia, um, yes, this is it, uh, reported on the 1st and 2nd of November uh, that Germany had deported thousands of Polish passport holders, almost exclusively Jews. Subsequent reports added that the deportees sat marooned in fields near border posts and had no access to food, clean water, or medicine. Some had already died. Curiously enough, Herschel Greenspan's name remained unknown to readers in Minsk, but not his actions, of course. Oktyabr, for the 11th of November, this is the, our initial slide in this series, um, explained the pogrom as a disproportionate, disproportionate act of retribution for the shooting of Ernst von Rath. And I quote from this article. Um, the German fascists have exploited the dispatches about the attack on the third secretary of the, of the German embassy in Paris into, an, into a drastic intensification of the terror against Jews, unquote. A nearly identical account ran the same day in Sovetskia, Belarusia. Both Minsk newspapers closed their report with the image of broken glass and merchandise scattered over the Friedrichstrasse, while stunned Berliners looked on in silence. More details emerged in the November 12th issue of Oktyabr and a parallel story in Sovetskia Belarusia. 
In a Reuters story relayed from London, police from in Berlin were observed standing by as attackers ransacked Jewish stores. Similar scenes occurred in Munich, Nuremberg, Frankfurt, and Cologne. Damage to synagogues was widespread. A report on the roundup of adult Jewish men gave a figure of 10,000 across greater Germany. Within days, Oktyabr elevated the figure to not fewer than 35,000, as relayed from the English press. On the 14th of November, Oktyabr and Sovetskaya Belarusia carried reports emphasizing the economic impact on Germany's Jews. For example, the new laws banned German Jews from engaging in private enterprises. In, a, in addition, Jews were, were forbidden from collecting on insurance policies. Several other follow-up stories appeared over the following week, outlining the subsequent events, the aftermath of Kristallnacht. What impact did these news reports have on Soviet Jews in Belarusia or elsewhere? Many were aware of Germany's rearmament and realized the threat that Hitler posed for capitalist Europe. Whether Kristallnacht or other anti-Semitic policies presented a specific danger in the minds of Soviet Jews is more difficult to assess. In the USC Shoah Foundation Institute's collection of testimonies, relatively few um, Soviet citizens, former Soviet citizens, mentioned Kristallnacht by name. Then again, Soviet Jews were not exposed to post-war remembrance of the Holocaust, and even by the 1990s, lacked the kind of vocabulary possessed by, for example, Polish Jews, um, many of whom had migrated to the West. One eyewitness, Alexander Liubich, born in Minsk in 1928, recalled in a 2005 interview how he learned about some events outside the Soviet Union. He read the newspaper. I give you a quote. I don't know why, but I happen to be interested in that, despite the fact that he was only in his, you know, 10 years old or less when these events were unfolding, I just outlined. He also remember, remembered learning about the 1938 pogrom in Germany from the newspaper, but not fully understanding its meaning. I have a quote here. Um, and it gives a sense of his hesitation, uh, indicating his past incomprehension. We cannot uh, know what has happened, how it happened. In this interview in 2005, his puzzlement is still apparent in his memories of uh, what he had learned about Kristallnacht. But instances where information was transformed into workable knowledge appear to have been few. Nazi aggression was a European affair, or so the Soviet press seemed to imply. Nothing pointed towards such an absurd notion as a German invasion. <coughs> We find frequent newspaper reports during the 1930s, even up to the eve of the German invasion in 1941, touting the strength of the Red Army and its border defenses. Such posturing filtered into many media. Soviet Yiddish writer Selig Aksarad, who was based in Minsk, penned a verse in 1939 recounting the thoughts of an alert border guard. It closed with these lines, and I apologize if the translation is not particularly poetic, but I am, um, did not try for uh, po you know, the lyrical class uh, aspect, but merely the content of the meaning. For bold Red Army fighters, for bravery, for clear-headed judgment, for secure borders of our land, to the last battle, for life and for death, we are ready, we are vigilant. Soviet cinema also conveyed reassuring messages. Sergei Eisenstein's um, Alexander Nevsky premiered soon after Kristallnacht. This told the medieval tale of German Germanic defeat in the face of Slavic resistance. Another film released in 1938 was the less cinematically accomplished If War Comes Tomorrow. This is essentially a Red Army recruitment film. Its plot presented an unnamed aggressor wearing stylized swastikas facing overwhelming Soviet land and air forces. Needless to say, this unnamed aggressor with stylized swastikas are resoundingly defeated. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact announced to the world on the 23rd of August, 1939, and the subsequent dual invasion of Poland brought the Third Reich 
up to the Soviet Union's doorstep. Hitler was now the new Western neighbor. And the non-aggression pact resulted in the disappearance of criticism of Nazi Germany from Soviet public discourse. For example, the films Alexander Nevsky and If War Comes Tomorrow were withdrawn from circulation. The Soviet press no longer reported on the treatment of Jews under German occupation. Rumors took their place, delivered by hundreds of thousands of refugees from, Pol from Western Poland, most of them Jews, who fled into Soviet-occupied Eastern Poland to escape Nazi brutality. Unfortunately, their audience among the native Jewish population in Soviet-occupied Poland free, frequently d dismissed such talk of escalating Nazi brutality. I could speak more about this, but in the instance of time, um, we can maybe ask, take a question afterwards. What I will instead focus is on are the Jewish refugees who fled into the um, uh, eastern part of the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, the older portion before 19, the 1939 annexation. Some of these Jewish refugees passed east of the former border in fulfillment of education and labor commitments. They encountered Soviet populations that had had the opportunity to read the newspaper accounts I have outlined above. Yet here, too, their experiences during the first months of German rule in Poland were met with disbelief. We see an example of this in the experience of Reza Gendelev, born in 19, oh, where's my picture? Uh-oh. Well, there should be a picture of Reza Gendelev with her two grandparents. I'm not sure where it went to. Um, well, Reza spent the summer of 1940 with her grandparents in Vitebsk, in, the east, in eastern Belarusia. She remembered decades later, quote, Vitebsk started to be crowded with some strange people. And when I asked my grandparents, they told me that these were Polish Jews running from Germany. Their presence alerted her, alerted her to, the pre, uh, to Jews living outside the Soviet Union. But why were they running? Was Germany a threat to all Jews? Reza's grandfather comforted her with misinformed words of reassurance. The Deutschen, Yiddish for Germans, are educated people, are highly cultured. They will not do anything to us. Yet what about these refugees, was the retort uh, she heard others say. Has something changed? Jews on Soviet territory, looking for official news reports about the treatment of Polish Jews under German rule, ran into a dead end. Warnings of German aggression disappeared as well, at least until the fall of France in June um, 1940. Thereafter, oblique allusions reemerged in the press, the Soviet press, about the threat of German aggression. By autumn 1940, Soviet newspapers printed short news items on, Germ on the German sustained campaign of aerial bombing of London um, and other cities. The tone of such reports hinted at sympathy for the British. A story on the passage of the Lend-Lease Act in March 1941 was described as an example of international cooperation, not collaboration between capitalist exploiters, as might be expected. But what inference? What inferences could readers draw from such stories? Could war come tomorrow? Unlike the rhetoric shouted in the 1930s, the subtle illusions in the Soviet press do not seem to have caught most people's attention. Um, there she is. Elena Hukmazova, uh, uh, born in Vitebsk in 1930, recalled in a 1939, 1998 interview that her family, quote, didn't feel that there would be a war, unquote. To put it another way, the war would not reach them, reflecting a false sense of security that many Soviet citizens felt in 1941. And indeed, the Soviet media seemed to, suge to suggest, we will protect you. Images of happy, safe children figured prominently in the pages of Oktyabr during the first months of 1941. One photo shows Soviet toddlers safe in a creche. Children in Brit Britain, meanwhile, hide in a trench looking skyward in fear of German airplanes. Contrasting such images, um, there's also the contrasting images here of mother and child, with us in peace, with them at war. Until the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, Soviet Jews had ready access to information on anti Nazi anti-Semitic policies and actions. Even when this was available, information seldom passed into practical knowledge. The situation deteriorated during the relatively brief but crucial period of the pact. 
when the Soviet leadership embargoed reports of escalating Nazi atrocities. When coupled with propaganda touting the invisibility of the Red Army, Soviet citizens and Soviet Jews in particular were left tragically vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Oh. This fits your thesis. Um, I was going to add, there are these two movies that are made in 38 and 39. Uh, one is Professor Mamluk, uh, which is about a German Jew, Jewish doctor who is <coughs> fired from his position and marched out with Yuda on him. Uh, and the other one, I think, is the Oppenheims, but I'm not sure. Opermans, the Opermans, yeah. right? Um, so they did. They did make these films. I mean, I'm just sort of drawing on Olga Gershenson's uh, work. You know that there was this kind of Holocaust work when you were anti-Nazi, mm -hmm. and she argues that it even enters into some of the war. It enters into some of the wartime films after '41, but of course not in that '39 to '41 period. Yes, thank you. Um, that I've I've um, come across references to those in your book, and um, um, I haven't had a chance to see either one, and I really want to. Um, the films I ref I referred to, um, I uh, I had found references to in some different survivor testimonies, um, uh, who some Jews. Um, in, in, contradicting even my own statement there that these films were embargoed, um, they, they report seeing them in uh, these newly annexed territories, uh, in either in Lithuania or in uh, former Eastern Poland, which I find rather interesting. Um, but I don't know that they would make something like that up. I think that if they really must have seen something. So All right, thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm wondering, um, between 39 and like 41, um, in Eastern Soviet-occupied Poland, was the Yiddish press able to continue reporting on the condition of Jews in the kind of West, the Western area or in Germany at all? Or was the kind of suppression we saw overall in, in the Soviet press during the period of, of the pact, did that extend into the, the Yiddish press? Um, the short answer to that is no, because those papers were closed down, along with uh, um, all other institutions. Uh, there was a new Yiddish press that was party sponsored. Um, in Bialystok, there was uh, the Bialystoker Stern, which I have been trying to trace down copies of for about 10 years now. I know there's some in Israel, and I've seen, I think, one or one or two issues of it. But uh, there's, I'm seeing a shaking of head. That's reassuring. You know, so, so that is a particular newspaper, especially because um, my research looks at some of these Soviet Yiddish writers, some of whom went to Bialystok, because they were trying to establish that as a, as a, as a place of uh, Soviet Yiddish culture, um, rather short-lived, of course, um, especially because uh, even though these Yiddish papers appeared in Bialystok, I'm not sure where else, uh, they, by the time of the German invasion, those papers had tapered off to maybe only, uh, say, maybe two or three issues a week, whereas initially there was about five, four or five issues a week. There was, so there was, there was this immediate introduction of the Soviet Yiddish cultural program, but as well as almost within a few months, a curtailment of it. Um, we know, have no idea what trajectory would that have been because the Germans invaded. So. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, um, after we have heard um, Anne Christine and yesterday Paul Moore, so I'm wondering if you can uh, talk a little bit about uh, this kind of source aspect which might be transnational. There was a slight remark about Reuters, but I wonder, for example, if this is the Jewish, Yiddish press in Belarus, where their connections to the Polish Yiddish press, um, where they saw, picked the up uh, reports from them, or, um, okay, that's the... Um, 
they, the Soviet press in general was all very sort of uh, centrally uh, controlled. Um, so I made reference to Sovetskaya Belarusia and how many of the same reports that were in Oktyabr were in Sovetskaya Belarusia. Actually, it's probably the other way around. Oktyabr was printing stuff in the Yiddish translation of what was in the Russian language paper. Um, and um, this is something I've only discovered, let's say, in the last year or so, so when I was able to get access to some of the Russian language newspapers published in Minsk. Um, the they were, there was really, they, they would not have dared print anything from the capitalist um, uh, Polish Yiddish press, which is how the Soviets would have referred to uh, the, um, uh, would have referred to those papers uh, in, in the communists in the Soviet Union. But then, um, in general, what was happening though with international news, and this is what surprised me when I first started researching all this, um, about the Soviet newspapers in general in the 19, 30s, which is what I looked at more speci most specifically, is that they were rep reporting a lot of international news. There would be in a special section of the newspaper. Soviet newspapers were pretty short. They were, you know, the Russian language newspapers might be eight pages, but might be only four pages. Yiddish papers were almost always just four pages, uh, just one sheet of paper. And there would be one little box um, that would take up maybe a quarter of the page. It would have all this international news, and it is repeating all this information that's happening in the rest of the world. world. And there was especially a special section during the Spanish Civil War that was reporting um, um, uh, uh, on the Spanish front was the, was the Yiddish title of this section. And that would have all this, all this news that was happening outside. Now, was there editorial selectivity? Absolutely. Um, but the thing that also surprised me was that, that this was really reporting um, news fairly straightforward uh, in a very straightforward manner. Uh, the problem I see, though, is, and this is what I alluded to in my paper, is people weren't able to really contextualize this information, especially with regard to the, um, uh, what was happening in Nazi Germany. At least I don't think they could really fully understand. Can I? Uh, yeah. Just a, a quick follow-up question. So this is interesting that they took up practically the Soviet press. Um, so I remember that uh, there was a big article about Kristallnacht and the Pravda, and uh, a, a very, really a big one, so for a full page. And so uh, when they picked up, did they change language, uh, or is this just one-on-one? -on -one? From the stories I look at from Minsk, um, I don't really detect uh, a distortion. The point, one point I did uh, talk about, which I didn't really answer in my own paper, was why this ec focus on all these economic issues. Uh, was this a critique of German Jewish, uh, of the German Jewish bourgeoisie? Very well could be. Um, then again, one of the things I found, this is just my own opinion, I think, but that they found in looking at Soviet newspapers in general, is that they were always talking about economic matters. Uh, there was always, it was, I found the most amazing thing was just how boring some of them were. Reading about production figures and target goals and, oh, you know, this inter-ethnic harmony in factories and how they're all working to make brushes in Minsk and this is their production figures for the year and they exceeded their targets. But they're always talking about things like this. So I don't, that also could be what is coloring that kind of impression. Uh, thank you, you know, for a really fascinating uh, paper. Um, I want to ask a question um, sort of relating to a kind of an offhanded remark you made just a minute ago, uh, where you mentioned that the, um, the, the frequency of circulation uh, changed, you know, uh, from you said like five days a week to only two or three days a week. Um, and this raises for me um, an interesting question, uh, which is, um, do you know what the actual circulation numbers were for this paper? Uh, in as much as uh, you know, we can talk uh, you know, a great deal about the content of, uh, of what was uh, being written, what was being presented, uh, but were people actually reading and getting this information? And so it's one thing to talk about the production of knowledge or the transfer of it you know, from, uh, from, from Germany, people sort of reporting on what's happening and so on and so forth, uh, but was this information being received 
And uh, you know, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, and um, that's one of the things I, I, I thought about. And uh, it's difficult to assess, but they're uh, in Aktiaber and in one of the regional newspapers I looked at, which was in uh, Vitebsk. They, I found a couple of reports where they talk about their circulation. And the numbers are very low in terms of how many issues were printed. Um, and uh, also in uh, um, uh, some of the, the you know, wonderful secondary literature that's looked at uh, um, the work of Soviet Yiddish writers, uh, there's discussion about what, how much circulation. And the Yiddish papers certainly had a much lower print run than the Russian language, or Belarusian language in, in Belar the Belarusian so Socialist Republic. Um, and uh, one of the things I really tried to find out is, how, who actually read the newspaper? I mean, this, this account from this 10-year-old, Alexander Lyubich, um, I don't know what newspaper he read. It, there were actually several. There were youth newspapers. There was uh, um, the, the Pioneers had a, had a, a paper in, in Belarusia. One of the Soviet writers whose career I follow is that uh, he wrote for that. Um, trying to find copies of that is n n nigh impossible. Um, the, um, uh, you know, it's the overall impression I get is that uh, numbers were fairly small. Now, were newspapers passed hand to hand? Mm, yeah, could be. And they certainly, I, I, that was the impression I got when reading about the circulation of the Yiddish press in Poland, which I did a little bit of comparison with, especially on this topic of these events in, um, uh, uh, related to Kristallnacht, as well as other events in Nazi Germany. You know, it was interesting to compare the, the two kinds of reports. Is there any comparative work on what was going on in Biro Bijan with the press in Biro Bijan? I'm not really aware. I've only looked at reports of Biro Bijan mm -hmm. in, um, in the Belarusian Soviet Yiddish press. Yeah. Um, because uh, what did people in Belarusia know about Biro Bijan? Because uh, some Did of the they? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, they, they, oh yeah. There were yeah, there were stories okay. fairly frequently about it, huh. um, and uh, you know, uh, one of the survivors whose stories I, I, mm -hmm. I track, her brother had gone to Berabajan in the 1930s, and then she never mm -hmm. talks about him the rest of his ter rest of her testimony. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea what happened to him, um, and I'm not familiar with what survives as far as. Mm -hmm. the, the press in Bureau Bajan. I mean, because one of the reasons, you know, they always say that Stalin creates this Jewish semi-autonomous uh, uh, republic is to compete with uh, Palestine as a place for Jewish refugees to go to. So it would, the press would, it might be worth, if you, if you have to go to Mongolia, but <laughs> it might be worth I, it. <laughs> I would love to, actually. Yeah. Uh, I, is... Um, there is a film. There was a Soviet film yeah. about they, they, which I find very fascinating. Yeah. And even in that Soviet film, you get the impression this is not a good, this is not a wonderful place to be. Right. This is actually yeah. very hard living right. there. So, yeah. So we're we're really lucky with this panel that there are a series of themes that are woven through it, particularly about the circulation of information about events and the way news circulated at various distances from the events. And then you raise the issue of rumor and gossip once traditional journalism and access uh, to news gets shut down. And I wonder, is there a pattern or a shape to the rumors? Do they consistently underplay uh, the gravity of what's going on, do they overplay it? Is, do you see any consistency to rumor and gossip? I would not say they underplay it. I think that the rumors that, because um, uh, my research focuses on two, two cities, Grodno, which was in eastern Poland, and Vitebsk. And the uh, uh, rumors, the recipients of rumors in Grodno tended to be dismissive because they just thought these atrocity stories um, for one thing, you have to understand is that there were uh, thousands of these wretched refugees who were passing through, ten, you know, tens of thousands passing through Bialystok, and certainly thousands that inundated Grodno. And so the local community there, um, it's, it has the, they have these new occupiers, uh, the Soviets, who are, who are you know, 
who are dismantling the existing institutional structure. There's all these refugees. The Soviets are doing some things for them, but the local community is trying to do their, fulfill their traditional role. And um, it's, it seems to be only when that these refugees have a family connection that people actually listen to them, you know, have the time to listen to them. And um, you just want to, you know, scream up them across the decades, you know, listen to what they're saying. And that's what some of these uh, survivors in their accounts and published in, in memoirs and in their testimony saying, you know, we were told this, but we didn't know how to understand this. We didn't know, we, we knew that the Germans were bad, of course, you know, our local press in Grodno was telling us all these things, you know. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the previous, uh, uh, in the previous panel is the question of what was in the Polish regional press. Uh, one of the hard problems is trying to find, track down issues about, that talk about Kristallnacht, because there's just not very many of these newspapers survive, as well as many of these newspapers had such an infrequent print run because they were having terrible financial problems staying in business. Um, it is a very interesting question. I just want to make an immediate re how's that? Is that is that clear? I can't I tell if this is on. Yeah, I don't know if it's on. It is okay, it is. Oh, there. Um I'm, just an immediate reaction to the last thing you've said. And um in a way it's one of the themes that I think covers through so much of this dis you know, sort of kind of long, big discussion about uh, Nazism and so on. We said, I wish they had, li I want to scream at them and get them to listen. Well, what if they had listened? What options did they have? And um, I think that um, we have a kind of um, sense of, you know, that these that there was, uh, there were options, that there was empowerment. What would difference would that have made? Where where could they have gone? What they could, what could they have done? So. I say that real purely uh, in a sense, it kind of reflects the same questions that I'm dealing with in my paper about uh, the uh, Jews in the United States. So had they read more, had they, would that really have mattered? So I'm not sure there's an answer to that. But. Yeah, this one, this one uh, survivor who writes about, uh, he was about 13 years old in 1940. And these uh, relatives come to, uh, uh, from Western Poland and say, they, they tell what's going on under the Germans and they say, they, they tell the, the family, come with us, come with us. And they, they, this, this family finds a car and they, they hire a car and a driver and they, they drive off and they never hear from them ever again. Um, we don't know. Because within about six months is when the Germans invaded. We had one oh, here earlier. I'm oh, just curious. Um, had you had you gotten into any of the the literature or other print media at the time? Were there books coming out that were relating to this in general this topic? Uh, in the Soviet Yiddish press, oh yeah, there was there was a, um, there's a very interesting article on Soviet interpretations of Nazi racial ideology. It's very fairly long and fairly dense. So it's it's a very sort of interesting point of view. Uh, there was, cool, you know, very critical materials on Nazi Germany. I mainly look at the Yiddish press, okay, not the Russian language press, which would have been there too. Um, but all these things are embargoed after after the pact, and um, I don't know if they were actually pulled off the shelves of libraries. Certainly during the purges, there was lots of things that were pulled off the shelves, so it could have been. Um, I also look at um, Soviet lit Yiddish literature based on this example from Zillik Oxarod. So I'm very interested in what the, the literati were also writing about. Um, some of it, especially, unfortunately, Axelrod tends to be very, a lot of sycophantic praise for Stalin, um, especially by after the purges. That was really the only way to go. Uh, but there's also some very interesting sort of um, echoes of traditions in Yiddish literature that still survive up and through the purges, because I referred to a couple of Yiddish, Soviet Yiddish writers who were arrested and disappeared. Well, they had written things in the mid-1930s that were, you know, perhaps not as fully in line with socialist realism as uh, the authorities would have liked, because they were referring to life in the shtetl and uh, Jewish religious life. Um, 
it was some very curious sort of works that came out. These, the two writers were um, Moshe Kolbach and Issa Harek, um, and they were mentors of a, of a particular writer who um, was born in 1905 and died in, um, no, I take that back, he was born in 1913, and he died in 2004. Uh, and he survived this whole period, including fleeing from the Germans in 1941. We'll take one last question. Um, thank you. I have more uh, of a comment than a question um, regarding the if issue of rumor and gossip. At least uh, for Warsaw, I can say that in the early 1930s and 1933 uh, also some Jewish intellectuals criticized really harshly the Jewish journalists to, um, to write to negative on Nazi Germany regarding the fact that they um, criticized, oh, you write all the time about Hitler, Hitler is everywhere, only Hitler. So they... Um, wanted to be uh, the Jewish journalists to be more optimistic and to be more hopeful. This is one point. And the second point is uh, regarding the question if knowledge made a different, at least uh, a difference, at least for the Yiddish journalists um, I'm doing my research on, I can say that knowledge for them made a huge difference after the war broke out because they then relatively quickly could decide that they um, must leave the country because they had all the knowledge and they reflect about this in their memoirs really um, clearly that because they had the knowledge and the networks that they um, used this information and their networks to get out of the country and this is also uh, an issue you could have the knowledge but if you don't have the context and the social class background you had no option and what is interesting is that most of the journalists fled to soviet occupied Wilna with a journal there was a journalist train organized by the polish government to get all the journalists non-jewish and jewish journalists out of the country to do more uh, press coverage on the um, on the events on the um, war and they, when they arrived in Wilna they came together and organized themselves really quickly in a new committee to, um, to do more reports and interviews with Polish Jewish refugees and to cover the events of the destruction of Polish Jewry through Nazi Germany and they did so until 1941 and there's a really um, wonderful book written about the story of this committee by Miriam Schultz. I just have a quick comment in reply. Um, one of the things that during your paper that I, it reminded me of um, is that w I looked a little bit at the Warsaw Yiddish Press, um, concurrent in Kristallnacht. The thing is uh, that what I was a little surprised by was that Kristallnacht wasn't necessarily front page news. What was front page news was the Whitehead Commission uh, about Palestine. And this is part of the context, of course, is that the, if, if if you have to escape from Nazi Germany, then what is your option? Well, this was a closing off up a road and you know, closing off that road. Okay, one, we'll take one final quick yeah, question. Just a, just a very short, no, it's a short comment. Uh, there's a, one of the volumes of the Ringelblum archive uh, is, uh, contains 50 reports uh, given by people who returned <coughs> to German occupation from Soviet occupation between uh, 39 and, uh, between uh, in, in the winter of 41 42 because they assumed that it can't be as bad under German occupation as it was under Soviet occupation in in eastern Poland so that that is a very very interesting reflection of what of context and of what people knew they were they would return to occupied uh, Poland uh, and probably all perished uh, and these are f 50, 52 reports, very long reports, extremely interesting about the perception of authoritarian occupation or, or the okay, German occupation and the Soviet occupation. So uh, that's a very interesting background on, on what people were able to know and, and uh, highly recommendable. So this, this is a volume which is obviously Ringelblum uh, Archive edition, it's translated from Yiddish into Polish, mostly. Thank you. And let's thank Jeff Kerber.
our last speaker today on this panel is Carol Pfefferman. Carol Pfefferman is a senior lecturer in Jewish history at Ariel University in Israel. He is a member of the Yad Vashem Public Commission to Designate Righteous Among the Nations, and he's written extensively on the Holocaust in occupied Soviet areas and World War II in the Soviet Union. His most recent book is The Holocaust in the Crimea and the Caucasus, uh, Yad Vashem 2016. And the title of his talk today is what did Soviet Jews make of Kristallnacht? No, no, I read the last one again. <laughs> is um, public responses to Kristallnacht in the Jewish community in Japan-controlled Harbin. Thank you. Thank you for your nice introduction. And of course, uh, thanks a lot to the organizers for, for this invitation, for, the, for giving the opportunity to attend such an important gathering with, with this, you know, and to, to share with you what I think about this, uh, let's say, relatively godforsaken region in the whole perspective of, you know, the Holocaust history. Mm, I must say that, you know, I have a personal connection to this region because one of my relatives um, fought in the Russian Civil War on the, on the, uh, against the Reds on the, on the side of the Whites and escaped to Harbin. And so this is, a, to some extent, it is also a personal story. Um, now, um, let me begin. Uh, yeah, I will begin with some... Uh, pictures and you know and you know probably more li a li lively discussion and then I will uh, resort to reading what I what, what, what I wrote uh, now this is uh, mm, the story that I'm going to tell you about is the story about of um, mm, of the need to report in the closely controlled region uh, by the country that was uh, on the way to become a uh, Germany, Nazi Germany's good friend, but it didn't become full-fledged uh, German partner by that time. And so the events we are talking about are occurring within a very small uh, window of opportunities for the, the, you know, the, the Jews had at their disposal to, to express themselves, but there were already very severe restraints of this, um, on this possibility of uh, self-expression. Um, so Mm. Uh, whatever you know in trying to understand why the Jewish media uh, by the way what when we are talking about the Jewish Jewish media it was a small community I will talk you know I mentioned soon the numbers we have more or less one newspaper and a half that was published uh, once uh, why you know a weekly newspaper and uh, it was a small community so we don't have here a wide spectrum of opinions that we you know have for example in Poland and uh, but still this was something for this community and it was you know the the whole setting it was so bizarre by the standards of that time uh, that it's worth uh, being analyzed so um, it was uh, be, be, be behind the story we have the uh, emerging Nazi, Nazi uh, Japanese islands it's not yet for the, in the it's not yet uh, you know full but it, it is already present uh, and um, the way the Japanese perceived the Jews and uh, and this international uh, situation in the in the entire region, which I, I mentioned generally speaking here here in the in this uh, report, talk of only Germany, but there were also other important players like China, uh, like the Soviet Union, uh, and uh, of course uh, Western democracies, and most most the most important country, which I hardly mention here, which was of of of, of utmost importance to Japan, uh, was the United States. Uh, and so when the Jews had to 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 um, to struggled with the question how to properly report the events uh, in the in Europe, uh, they had to you know to solve several seemingly uh, irreconcilable problems. For example, they had to, of course, to, to, to they felt the need to express their outrage uh, uh, over the persecution of, uh, um, of of their brothers in Europe, and at the same time they had to. Uh, 
be very careful in order not to embarrass the Japanese, uh, which were the real rulers of this region. And uh, um, they had to uh, also to tell, to be able to, to, to convince the Japanese that also, the, despite the fact that Ju the Jews uh, are um, under attack now, they're still strong enough and should be reckoned with. Um, and uh, mm, of course, with uh, trying to not to dissuade uh, the Japan, uh, Japanese government from uh, accepting the same policy towards the Jews as as, as their friends in Berlin. Um, now, several you know brief uh, words about the story of this um, uh, more or less exotic community. Uh, it was the story which coincided with the Russian penetration uh, to the Far East, uh, which was of course of you know the region was uh, the border, uh, borderland uh, of the Russian Empire, and was uh, uh, it all began at the end of the 19th century and with the uh, because of the economic penetration. Uh, you know, railroads, all the story, and, and Jews uh, followed Russians, uh, and oh, for some, to some extent were even encouraged by the imperial authorities to settle there and the, to protect the imperial interests in this uh, region. Of, and now, uh, in uh, uh, I, I don't speak here about it at, at, at lie, you know, in detail, but uh, um, oh. Okay, let's let me talk. Uh, return to it a bit later. In '32, the region ca came under uh, Japanese domination. Uh, it was the start of the, you know, the first phase of the uh, uh, Japanese Sino uh, War, Sino Japanese War, and uh, mm, the state, that what was the puppet state that was established by the by the Japanese, was called uh, Manchukuo, uh, and it was a huge state as you see here on the map. And of course, you know, it was only nominally independent. Uh, and uh, it, this was the place that was destined uh, to, to host this uh, Jewish uh, community. No, by the way, not the Harbin community was not the only Jewish community in this region, but we, we will focus here on this community because it was the largest and because there are more or less, uh, we have records, uh, or some records uh, on, uh, on what took place there. Uh, regarding the sources uh, and the records, uh, uh, I probably won't have an opportunity to talk about it uh, a bit later. So we have newspapers, or a news, one newspaper and a half, so to say, published in this region uh, by the Jewish community. And the records uh, and the diaries of the community led uh, leader uh, of the, in Harbin uh, are all in Moscow in uh, KGB archives because the guy was, uh, the, the head of the Jewish community was arrested by the Red Army in August 1945 and, uh, sent, uh, and accused of co having collaborated with the Japanese and sent to 10 years uh, uh, and condemned to 10 years uh, prison uh, imprisonment in, in Siberia. So, and it is still there, and you know, it would be very interesting to, to, to have a look at it, but uh, not now. Uh, now, this was the, uh, uh, so uh, it, it was the um, Jewish community that coexisted uh, within the much larger Russian community, and uh, all of them, you know, came there for this, you know, both Russians and Jews for the same purpose. First of all, driven by economic needs, and second, they were refugees from the Russian Civil War, uh, and um, so the the numerical strength was more or less one to ten uh, in Russian favor, and Russians were an important player in this region, despite the fact that they didn't have by that time the power behind them, uh, but um, mm uh, the uh, uh, the you know it was a you know a very anti-Jewish community, very pro-fascist fascist community. In fact, the, in, by 1931, they established uh, uh, one big uh, Russian fascist party, which was and the, all these ideas of fascism and anti-Semitism were extremely popular in this community, and uh, they bore the uh, impact. Uh, they had the impact on the Japanese policy towards the Jews. Uh, now, the person in talk, uh, we are talking about, uh, and he was the head of the community and the, uh, the chief editor of this newspaper, was uh, Avraham Kaufman. He was a doctor, and uh, he was the one who was able to uh, very skillful uh, navigate his communities in these turbulent times. Um, and um, so when we are talking about what was published here in the newspapers, uh, and you know, even sometimes he published the articles, uh, um, 
uh, under his name. Uh, we, sometimes it, it was under his pen name, but he was the driver, you know, driving force behind uh, finding the way to deal with the Japanese in this time. Uh, so several words about the Japanese, you know, just very briefly, the uh, J Japanese attitudes towards J the Jews, because without it, it is impossible to understand what took place there. The first person to be mentioned here is a very important Jewish banker, Yaakov Schiff, uh, who was the head of the Jewish community uh, I mean, until his death in 1920. And he was the one who gave a huge loan, actually the h half of what uh, Japan needed in the, in its, uh, during its war with the Russia. Empire in 1904 or 2005, and, uh, and he gave this money specifically in order to let the Japanese win the war against the Russian Empire, which was regarded the, um, as a press of the Jewish people. And the Japanese remembered that, you know, at least some people, you know, all the people in the Japanese establishment, uh, that, you know, the, as a sign of a Jewish power and the Jewish power that could be. Uh, harnessed uh, to for for for, for Japanese uh, Japan's uh, benefit. Now the second important figure uh, in is uh, the Russian uh, industrialist uh, um, in the Far East uh, who uh, was also the head of the um, provisional government uh, there th for the certain time. And he was the one who, uh, pu who uh, funded the publication or the translation of the Japanese edition of the Protocols of, Zion, of, Z of, of the Elders of Zion. Uh, and uh, um, uh, see, it's so in another fact that we have to uh, to understand is this you know the the, the region we are talking about this uh, uh, harbin or more generally manchuria was controlled by the japanese uh, army which was uh, a force uh, you know staffed by people with you know v quite quite a number of them uh, harbored very um, uh, anti jewish feelings yet this um, uh, it uh, it was you know Japanese anti-Semitism. It is all, all, all of, uh, re usually referred to as anti-Semitism. It was very much different from the European or German anti-Semitism, uh, in that it it uh, it recognized the Jewish uh, aspiration for global domination, uh, but it didn't regard it as a threat to Je to, to Japan. It was devoid of a specific Christian. Uh, um, underpinnings, and um, so it was a force that should could be rec should be reckoned with and could be uh, capitalized on if need be, from the Japanese perspective. And uh, it so happened that you know the the um, Japanese army, which was in control of our region, uh, was stuffed to no small extent by these people with who had this um, strange uh, uh, harbored such strange ideas towards the Jews and uh, towards their power. Uh, exaggerate, you know, exaggerated their power. Uh, even though, you know, the, you know, the, the what, the, what was uh, tell, told in Berlin about Jewish uh, 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 aspiration for world domination was close to them. Now I will have to, uh, unfortunately, to to skip on that uh, uh, over that, and I will return to uh, to my to my major topic. Uh, Kristallnacht in the um, uh, in this uh, how it was covered by the Japan uh, by the Harbin uh, Jewish media. Uh, now um, um, it took time. It, 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 uh, it, the idea was how to publish without antagonizing the the Japanese, uh, and uh, so it was the f it, all, all of the publications followed the same strategy how to to sound out what the Japanese would accept and what would, uh, would, would embarrass them in order so it should be said without saying too much. Uh, and uh, this was, those were the rules of the games, but they were not immediately clear to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the Japanese, to the Jewish media. So this is how uh, initially we have uh, reports or even references to uh, uh, wild programs in Germany. Uh, and uh, this is the quotation. But the next reference uh, refers uh, to uh, anti-Jewish measures in Germany. Uh, and then it is followed to the state of affairs of German Jews and the you know and such um, I would say bizarre reference which um, you know you can hardly find anywhere else in Jewish media as uh, reprisals made by the German population to get compensation for the embassy's secretary assassination. And now, uh, but uh, uh, so over time, it became clear that the 
the, the ideal path of, of in covering these events would be to tell, to say as much as possible as about what was going on and, and was, because it's, it, it was still as an ongoing event without criticizing Germany. Because, you know, the, 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 the Haben Jews realized it would, be, it would be too dangerous. So uh, there, any reference to Germany had to be avoided as much as possible. So as, and as you know, the, we, we have such uh, headlines as the one, as you, as you see in, my, in, the, uh, in the heading of my presentation, you know, the you know, against anti-Jewish uh, excesses uh, uh, in uh, a response for uh, von Rath's assassination. Uh, and um, the um, uh, the oh, it was you know the condemnation was was ver was very harsh. For example, horrors and nightmare, nightmare, but the, the you, know, by, you know made by whom envisioned and implemented by the followers of anti-human theories. Who are these people? It was never said. Uh, and um, now. Um, they reported uh, about specific events, uh, of, you know, arrest of Jews, uh, sending them to uh, concentration camps, and even the names of the concentration camps were, were given, like Buchenwald. But where was it? You know, was uh, was it located? It was never said. Uh, and uh, um, uh, e what was very important uh, is uh, in this coverage is uh, that. Uh, um, uh, over time, it is quite quickly, in fact, it switched towards uh, uh, putting the blame not uh, for, for what was going on in Europe, for the, uh, for, for the Kristallnacht and the uh, following events, not only in Nazi Germany, but also on other world powers that let it happen. Uh, for example, uh, England, France, and the United States were explicitly uh, uh, accused of uh, for their failure to to deliver on the promises they they made uh, um, they made to the Jews. Uh, and uh, uh, here is the quotation, for example: "With all uh, negative attitude towards anti-Semitism, the great powers did not take any single step, real and active, to put an end to this bacchanalia of death and destruction." Uh, and uh, you know, even in some cases, the even democratic states were even uh, uh, accused of being instrumental of creating Greenspan case. And in fact, they were put uh, more or less uh, in this and some other cases on the same footing as, as as Nazi Germany, which was not called by its name. And of course, such a, a line was um, that you know, and for and it cul could culmin it culminated in uh, um, in such uh, statements as democratic countries. Uh, you know, led the world and not only the Jewish one to disaster. And such statements, of course, were very close to uh, Japanese decision makers, because you know, the, who, uh, who and um, you know, felt on very receptive uh, ears on uh, on in, in uh, Japanese on, uh, administration in Hamajuri and also in, in Tokyo. Um, now, what was also unique about uh, the uh, um, the Jewish cover uh, the coverage of events in this origin was the fact that the um, Harbin Jews felt the need to address somehow Nazi accusations against the Jews leveled in the in the wake of this uh, assassination and there was uh, several uh, you know generally you know they were put to the best of my knowledge they were never uh, addressed but here it was in the context of uh, of uh, Japan and of course Japanese editors and bureaucrats were the main readers of such newspapers it is it is it's, it is clear beyond doubt uh, and uh, so uh, this uh, uh, these the articles, these specific articles were, 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 were designated for them, for, and uh, so we sh it should come as no surprise that uh, Herschel Greenspan uh, was uh, referred to adolescent youngster, a youngster fanatic who lost his balance or uh, carried an individual action. Of course, according to the New Jewish newspaper, uh, he had. Uh, no, he, the, the entire Jewish nation had no, you know, could not uh, take any responsibility for the action uh, committed by uh, by uh, the, 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 by this youngster, and uh, um, uh, and generally speaking, uh, you know, his motives, uh, you know, the explanation of his motives ranged from uh, he did it because of the sufferings or uh, caused by the recent events, uh, recent callous actions against Jews, by whom. Again, you know, one could, you know, everyone understood who, you know, who was referred to, but, you know, but, and of course, you know, yes, yes, yes. Uh, 
uh, and uh, of course and he was you know sometimes it was said that you know he did because he was uh, uh, insane um, now um, it was also said that the Jewish community as a, as a, as a, as a whole is a, a vehemently opposed to the use of terror or you know even you know a bit more threatening uh, uh, statement did not see any expediency in it and this statement could be read as a you know as a, as as a moment you know it's more menacing and imply that under certain circumstances if driven to corner Jews can uh, may, may may might resort to force so even the the use of of, of what wall jewelry was very wide in the newspaper we, my assumption is because the uh, because the the editor of the newspaper wanted the Japanese to believe in its existence, uh, and um, it was uh, there were several uh, proofs that it, this force existed. Uh, uh, for example, important influential figures uh, expressed their sympathy uh, with the Jews and diplomatic actions um, made by f foreign powers in favor of Jews, uh, and uh, all this was presented it as a sign of that the Jewish power was still there, it should be reckoned with. Um, and um, mm, over it, it became clear that this, this uh, policy over time, at least for the time being, bore its fruits, uh, and the Japanese uh, assured the Jewish community that uh, despite the approach Rapushima with Nazi Germany, uh, this would not affect their attitudes uh, towards Jews as long as the Jews followed the rules uh, of the country. And of course, this uh, this was uh, solemnly promised to, to, to the Japanese. Um, and uh, so this uh, balancing, uh, you know, as long as Japan was interested in looking for other options beyond the alliance with uh, Nazi Germany, uh, could continue for the time being. And, uh, and the end of 1939, uh, the beginning of 39 was, uh, you know, was was still this uh, period when this window of opportunity was still open. Thank you very much. Terrific. Um, questions? Yeah, I guess Here so. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. My mother grew up in Shanghai, China after escaping Berlin. And she would always refer to the Jews of Harbin, which is up the coast from where they were living. And when they moved into Shanghai, they brought a very different culture. Were they so different, or was it just the years, either the 10 years of wartime or things of that sort, that were the big differences? Yes, as you say, you are the boss here. Oh, what was your question? Do you want me to answer it immediately, you know, as you say? We, yeah, let's do, we have time yeah. to do one by one. Yeah. It's a great question, you know. Shanghai is, vo is a world in its own right. Just to give you an idea of how different it was uh, uh, from what we have just discussed. Uh, so it was the story of not only Japan, Japan controlled by 1940, by the mid-1941, only one quarter of the region of, of, of Shanghai. The rest was controlled, it was an international community. And the rules were set by the Brits, by the French, and, and other countries. Uh, it did it necessarily you know did it mean uh, necessarily mean that uh, you know these these parts of Shanghai controlled by other countries were friendly towards Jews not at all but the argue you know the argumentation the, the arguments were very different and the Jews in Shanghai was of course uh, it, it was an entirely different story it was a story of uh, Ashkenazi Sephardi coexistence and the, and the story of very extremely rich uh, Sephardi Jews uh, you know the most prominent probably among them was uh, the Jewish billionaire whose name was Sasson, who you know contributed to the uh, to sustainers of poor uh, German Jews, and uh, it's, it, and once the war began, I mean the Great War with with America, it, 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 it you know the rules of the game uh, changed because all those who had British citizenship uh, they they were discriminated you know most brutally by the Japanese because uh, the the Brits were the enemies and so on. But it was the story a very different story I would say. And another story is that the Shanghai was and the coastal area was controlled by by the Japanese Navy which was started by other people, not by, um, how would I call it, uh, mm, 
but also anti, uh, you know, anti-Jewish. But you know, the um, they were more legalist. Uh, the they were less dreamers. They didn't believe that much in Jewish power, global power, and that's why they felt no need to to make some, uh, you know, to to make concessions to to the local Jews. So, and was it a compete, you know, it's, it was a huge story in Japan, you know, two forces that competed for, you know, for power, for, for budgets, and actually for, the, for what cost to take uh, during the war, the army versus the navy. Questions? Oh, I'm really fascinated by the evacuation of the perpetrator and the, you know, paraphrasing, how can you name without naming um, the perpetrators, right? So did you feel that it was clear who was being referred to in these reports? Um, or was there any, you know, could people read between the lines? I mean, um, and, and, and how do you feel, how, how was the reporting without naming Nazi Germans, how, how was it received? In other words, you know, by refraining from naming the perpetrators, do you feel it was effective? Did it circulate in public discourse? Uh, from what we know, uh, it uh, everyone understood who you know who was referred to, and everyone understood that it was extremely you know which people sh you know it should be you know reported in an extremely cautious way, because no one you know Jews were after all newcomers to the Far East. And they didn't know what kind of country, you know, was Japan. Japan Japanese were also newcomers to to to, to Manchuria, and so uh, and an additional factor that made things more difficult to understand for us and even for them was the Japan. Japan was it was for researchers it an extremely interesting case because Japan spoke with different voices. Uh, and they had many opinions. Even the anti-Semites were divided, you know, among themselves what to do with the Jews. So, and uh, um, and the, you know, it was a different mentality. And the, but the, the the Jews quite quickly, you know, realized, you know, after sounding out, you know, what could be said and could be avoided, uh, what was the preferable line. For, exa for example, they uh, um, put an emphasis on uh, um, on. Bar of uh, uh, actions of unnamed power in Europe, and it was very, you know, this, it was, you know the Japanese liked it. You know, the, you know, it was, you know, barbarism in Europe. You know, it's, it's not, it was incomprehensible for the Japanese, by the way. You know that, you know, it, such things could happen, uh, could take place in enlightened Europe, but that, that, you know, other countries could be accused of barbarism, whereas Japan itself, you know, could be presented as a, a how do they, did they call it as a, as a, as a. Um, Great East Asia uh, co-prosperity sphere, and also the and and all nations, including Jews, were entitled to live peacefully under the uh, auspice of the Japanese emperor. So this was that should be said, and you know this, you know, the Japanese liked it. Uh, uh, what do you think, uh, uh, how the Japanese uh, uh, saw the Jews comparing to the Russians, to the Russian majority there? Was it the same pay, uh, uh, face in their eyes or some difference? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, the Japanese, uh, uh, with the exception of few people who had a good uh, proficiency in Russian language, had to uh, rely on Russian interpreters. Uh, Russian, Russian, ethnic Russian interpreters, and uh, who were overwhelmingly uh, not the best friends of the Jews. And the Japanese knew it, but uh, they um, so and they knew that their, you know, this mediator um, was uh, reported the events, uh, you know which are of relevance to Jews, you know, in the light that was unfavorable for the Jews. So, and they let it happen, they understood the difference between the two groups, uh, and uh, 
um, the um, the Jews in some respects were uh, uh, so the, 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 over time the Japanese uh, managed to when they firmly you know were firmly in control of the region uh, were uh, able even to overcome uh, Russian animosity to, towards the Jews uh, and uh, uh, actually uh, uh, forcing Russian community which was anti very much anti-Jewish uh -huh. to uh, accept Jews in uh, you know all local pan-Russian organizations uh, and uh, because they allegedly had one big uh, enemy, Russian communism, uh, and uh, they they felt this difference. But you know, they and they also, I would say, they it, at least during the period under review, during the Crystal Nacht, and the you know until uh, um, until um, the non-aggression pact with Germany, uh, the uh, Jews um, were uh, were in high esteem. Because they had a larger, uh, you know, but yeah, even probably much larger uh, international cloud than the Russians. Behind, behind the Russians, there was no foreign power. Behind these Russians in far, far east, and Jews were an unknown quality, and probably they did have some something, not exactly the power, but something very, very important. And uh, so and they understood this difference, but you know, they saw it through their own lens. Yes, let's thank our three presenters. Is it working? Maybe as a concluding thought, I, I'd like to point out or have us think about how well synchronized these three papers were and sort of the themes about the press and the circulation of knowledge and the distance of these different communities from the, from the events. So with that, thank you, everyone. And we also thank the chair, Mala Stone. Yeah. So,